Abrun, in the uh, past couple of days, um, both through uh, your uh, lectures, presentations, and uh, uh, the experiment we had the opportunity to share this morning, um, you pretty much uh, demonstrated how markets can create bubbles. Uh, for me, at least, this goes a little bit against the traditional grain, well, it's not traditional, let's say grain of, uh, for example, Austrian business cycle theory that uh, treats, um, you know, bubbles as being created uh, in an exogenous fashion by, for example, monetary shocks, and credit shocks. Uh, but it appears from experimental research, uh, uh, results that the market itself is quite capable of, of, of creating bubbles. What, what is a bubble and, and how, does, how, do, how do your findings, uh, uh, how do you view your findings related to this concept of bubbles being created exogenously by monetary shocks, for example? Well, I think as I interpret the Austrian arguments, uh, there's an interaction between kind of monetary policy and uh, credit financial uh, uh, developments. But also I think there's a, one of the central ideas as I understand Austrian economics is that there are sort of credit cycles, credit experience, even if you didn't have a monetary authority uh, in, a, in a system where credit can be expanded beyond uh, immediate availability of funds through savings, then you can have distortions in markets. And so what you have kind of can have expansions and contractions that are kind of driven by, by uh, credit. And it's one of the reasons why I think uh, uh, Hike was concerned about, you know, the, the, the banking and credit systems and the reliability of the monetary system, fiat money versus, uh, uh, versus uh, uh, monetary systems that <clears throat> were uh, less subject to getting out of control through uh, uh, bank credit expansion. Uh, now in, in the laboratory, uh, and we've certainly not I explored a lot of those issues fully in the laboratory, but one of the things we've, we have done is to look at asset trading in an environment in which people do have the information that they need in order to know what the basic value of the asset is, the fundamental value of the assets. Uh, and what we find is that, uh, and particularly depending upon how much cash we endow them with, and this is where, the, where money becomes in an important, in an important way, uh, we can identify uh, trading at prices that, that if they deviate from these fundamental values, then we know we have a bubble because that's something that is not sustainable in, in, the, uh, in the long run. It may be sustainable for short periods, and in fact, subjects in the experiments do sustain these bubbles for a while, but they always, they always crash uh, toward the end. Now, we can show that if you want to get a bigger bubble, you allow people to buy on credit, borrow the money to, to buy uh, uh, this asset. They will then bid it up um, more vigorously because it isn't entirely their own money. It's to some extent money, somebody else's money that's come to, th uh, th to them through a, a loan. So. <clears throat> I think this is a, a, an, in, a uh, uh, an environment that could be used to study some of these uh, Austrian issues and in which you uh, 
might imagine introducing a monetary authority who is cry trying to stabilize things <clears throat> and may have uh, 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 may turn out to have an accelerator problem worse than than Toyota, <laughs> where the, where they're stepping on the accelerator to try to prevent uh, uh, a decline and end up uh, ca causing uh, uh, overexpansion. Those kinds of issues, I think, could be examined in these in these environments. Although I haven't personally done it, and and I think most of the experiments to date have not done it. Uh, one last question: What um, could you comment on uh, what you might consider uh, promising uh, avenues of research? in experimental economics? Well, I think there's just an incredible number of uh, problems in the field having to creating uh, auction type markets in, in environments that haven't existed before. They've been dominated by uh, central control and central directions and a good example of that in the past has been uh, the uh, 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 rights to use uh, the airwaves. Originally radio, then television, and now micro, uh, all, all forms of, of uh, com uh, communication involving uh, higher frequency wavelengths. And we've seen now over the last uh, 30 years a growing use of auctions t to allocate uh, rights. And here's something that's not a physical commodity. You can't taste it or feel it or put it in your pocket. It's a right to make use of something. And, uh, and if, if you define those rights, give people uh, uh, a property in them, allow them to be tradable, be retradable, it turns out that's a very effective way to organize something which in the past has just been licensed by the state to individuals and, and controlled by them. But there's many other areas, I think. Another area that's happened, been really boomed over the last 25 years, is the growing use of markets in electric power. You see, the. Uh, Electric power all over the world, if you go back 25 years before, uh, ago or before, they were completely dominated by state-run uh, state industry. An, an exception was the United States, but it was regulated. <laughs> okay, it was owned privately, but it was heavily regulated by the state. Well, in countries like uh, Chile, uh, New Zealand, Australia, United Kingdom. There was a movement toward the, uh, the liberalization of those power systems. In some cases, just outright privatization, which was largely the British model. Uh, <clears throat> and elements of that were also uh, evident in the, in the Chilean, New Zealand, Australian uh, experience. I think a third area that is becoming and going to be really important is water. Water is, is, has been a, an, an area in which uh, well-defined property rights have often not been defined. So people just dissipate water supplies because they don't have a they just have rule, there's some sort of rule of capture where if you get the water, it's yours. Um, and then you've had systems where uh, the government owns and controls the water supply and, 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 and then gives rights to farmers and various people. You see those models traditionally in California and Spain and so on. Well, now there's... <clears throat> the possibility, I think, of using decentralized uh, mechanisms and market mechanisms to better manage those resources. And, but because the information on what water is worth 
and how it's to be used is something that's inherently not available to any one mind, as Hayek would say. That's dispersed among all the individual users. And, and you need some way of making use of that, that information to determine how water ought to be allocated. And that's exactly what markets are for. Well, Professor Smith, thank you very much for your time and sharing your wisdom with us. Well, thank you, Fritz.